wow, you're here today. Wow, we, we're here today. Last week, one of the last things I shared with you was that I would be walking in a parade in Waukegan. Started not to share that last week for reasons that are obvious to some, but I shared it and a couple of you expressed your concerns, and rightly so. Then Monday happened a horrific 4th of July for those in Highland Park and for us as well. Proximity to us enough to keep some of us indoors until the alleged perpetrator was caught. Proximity enough to traumatize us. Televised enough to traumatize people across the United States and beyond, who can't believe it happened again so close in time proximity to Uvalde, Texas, Buffalo, New York, and, and, and. We've all been impacted, traumatized lately again and again and again, and yet, wow, we show up. My coworker who invited me to walk in the parade in Waukegan, she and I admitted that we were shaken after walking in the parade and then seeing what happened just 17 miles north in Highland Park. Excuse me, what, 17 miles from Highland Park one day later. And yet, I'm here. Admittedly traumatized. I think you all know that. I am human. Pastors are human. And yet we show up here and in pulpits across the nation. We keep on going. I know there are many emotions today, many responses to life and particularly to trauma that cause us to show up on Sunday after Sunday, especially when others have ceased to show up. There are many reasons we show up and I'm sure that today's psalm captures one of the reasons some of us show up. Our lectionary text, meaning it was chosen years ago and fell on this Sunday, captures why many of us show up each Sunday and why we showed up today. Actually, almost any verse in Psalm 25 could be the reason we show up. You can read it later and check that out for yourself. But here's the verse that I believe tells why many of us keep showing up in the midst of inexplicable pain and trauma and evil. And I'm going to read it from the Common English Version translation, which I trust. And I trust that it captures it a way that we can hear it. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long. In the midst of so much pain and chaos and confusion and trauma, I believe many of us keep showing up, not only because we are seeking God, but we are seeking God's ways and we are seeking truth. If our theology includes a God who would not allow things like mass shootings that leave toddlers without their parents or worse yet, kills toddlers. If our theology includes a God who would not allow these things to happen and then they happen, some of us don't give up on God. We keep showing up and saying, God, if that's not who you are, then who are you? Make your ways known to me. Teach me your paths. 
Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me. Because you are the God who saves me, I put my hope in you all day long. Even after Uvalde, and even after Buffalo, and even after Highland Park, and, 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 but I need you to teach me your ways. Because yeah. these ways are too much sometimes to bear. And we showed up today, and so did the Holy Spirit in the lectionary text, not only through Psalm 25, but also through the gospel scripture that was selected years ago that fell on today that I believe teaches us God's ways. Spoiler, spoiler alert, love has everything to do with it. Jesus said, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, What's written in the law? You're an expert. You know what it says. What does it say? And the man says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, You've answered rightly. Do this and live, but the man wants to justify something. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? This story known as the story of the Good Samaritan is so much more than that. It's a parable that holds foundational truths about God's way and about what Jesus expects from us who call ourselves Christians. And that if humans practice these truths, Christians or not, we'd end the terror that continues to traumatize us almost daily. How'd I get there? Let's go into the text. The man questioning Jesus in our text today is not only a lawyer, he's a legal expert. Have you ever met someone who was legalistic about his faith? This is him being represented in the text. He knows Moses' law and how it's been applied. The lawyer knows Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And he knows Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's love got to do with it? He knows that love is a principal thing, that love is commanded by God. His question to Jesus may very well be a genuine one. How do I get to heaven? I already know that love is required. I'm just wondering who I have to love. For you see, Leviticus 19, 18, I know the neighbor means fellow Israelite, but being an expert in the law, I also know Leviticus 19, 34, which says love the immigrant the foreigner in your land. So this lawyer, who the text says wants to justify himself, says to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Have you ever tried to justify your wrong? Do you know anyone, any group, any government who tries to justify their wrong? This man who knows this little wrinkle in the law that calls for him to to love not only his, only his his fellow Israelite, but to also love the immigrant, the one who doesn't look like him, talk like him, act like him, the one who is different from him. This man who's trying to justify something he's doing, this man who must have a problem with some person or some group of people, maybe some group of people who are irritating to him or who he's been taught to hate, this man who may even be teaching his children to have the same disdain for other, whatever other that might be. He wants to see if his wrongdoing will keep him out of the kingdom. But at least he had sense enough to ask Jesus. I believe he sincerely asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who do I have to love to still get in? Jesus knows, because that's just Jesus. He knows. 
Jesus tells a story. We normalize it by giving it a name, the Good Samaritan. We've boiled the story down to just a person doing good, and we believe that to just do good to a person on the side of the road, changing their tire or something, just hurt in a car accident, or help a senior with their groceries, or call the police when we see a crime, a purse snatched, or something, we believe to just be a good Samaritan is all there is to this parable. Please don't miss the so important and relevant truths of this text, which explains so much about this world, about humanity, and about Jesus. Jesus says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed leaving him half dead. Jesus, in one sentence, describes, in my opinion, the greatest and ongoing human tragedy. The human beings will steal from you, strip you down, leaving you vulnerable and wounded, and then leave you there to die. What's love got to do with it? Jesus knows that there are people who will love you like Ike loved Tina. If you don't know the story, look it up. You know Tina Turner saying, what's love got to do with it? Learn why she wrote the song. Jesus knows, and while a man seemed to want to know if he had to love the other, Jesus took the time to tell this story about human exploitation. Jesus knows there are thieves who don't mind injuring you to get what they want. Jesus knows there are thieves who will exploit and seek to destroy other human beings for their own gain. Yes. You see, Jesus knows not only that this is on an individual level, Ike and Tina, but, but he also knows that this is on a global level. Yes. Jesus knows about the transatlantic slave trade of enslaved Africans. West Africans who were enslaved and brought to the United States, Caribbean, and South America during the Atlantic slave trade, and that enslaved Africans were also taken to the Near East and other parts of Asia during the Arab slave trade, and that other Africans were taken to Pakistan and India. And Jesus also knows about the indigenous people who were systematically exterminated as part of colonization. Jesus knows that people fell among thieves in their own land as their land was taken from them. He knows about the Native Americans of this land and, and the Tano people of Jamaica and the Aboriginal people of Australia. And I could go on and on, but my knowledge limits me. But Jesus knows. Jesus knows that humans have the capacity on an individual and a global scale to severely injure other human beings and leave them to suffer. Jesus took the time to tell this story and the Holy Spirit made sure it made the final cut. As this lawyer seeks to justify his wrongdoing and wants to know if he keeps doing wrong, can he make it to the promised land? Jesus knows that there would always be modern day folks, even governments, trying to justify their stuff, but still want to know if they can make it in and have eternal life. And the enemy will take this scripture where Jesus makes God's ways and truths clear and have people boil it down to simply the Good Samaritan. Like changing somebody's tire on the side of the road and the deep truths of the text go unlearned even by those who show up every Sunday in their trauma still wanting to know God's ways. Jesus knows and the reason I keep showing up is because Jesus knows. If I had an inkling that Jesus didn't get it, I turn in my resignation. But thank God, Jesus knows. So Jesus helps the man, and if we allow him, Jesus will help us. 
Jesus says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, hear it, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. See, part of the problem is we start hearing it as an actual event, but it's a teaching by the master teacher, Jesus. He uses each character on purpose. He says, now a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, he came and looked, and he passed by on the other side. This, this text tells us so much more about what Jesus knows. Jesus knows that a priestly collar does not guarantee a loving heart. That you can be a priest or a preacher and have no compassion for the poor or those who are hurting. That you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Jesus knows. Jesus knows that those who work in the church, for the Levites assisted the priests, Jesus knows that they too can see someone hurting and walk on by. Take it a step further, Jesus knows that there were rules in the temple about staying ceremoniously clean. The priest and the Levite weren't supposed to, by the rules of the temple, touch that which was believed to be unclean. They were just keeping the rules of the temple. And if we had asked the priest or the Levite, they would have said, the rules say I had to pass by the man because, well, the rules say so. We want to know God's ways. Jesus is teaching us by the example of the priest and the Levite that church workers that sometimes there's a call on your life or a need that even trump church rules. What's love got to do with it? If only we would ask God before we pull out the church rules to justify ourselves. Jesus' story continues. He says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. You see, not only does Jesus know about the thieves who will exploit and seek to destroy other human beings for their own gain, Jesus also knows the condition of those who have been mistreated and exactly what they need to be made whole. Jesus knows that those who have been exploited are the most vulnerable among us and that they need health care, and sometimes they need mental health care. Do you know what a legacy of exploitation and marginalization can do to the mind? That's why he said the Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Jesus knows that the most vulnerable among us, injured by exploitation, need the basics in life, food, shelter, Clothing. That's why he said he set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. Jesus knows that the most vulnerable among us, still injured by and recovering from exploitation, need ongoing help and care. That's why he said the Samaritan, before leaving the man, took out some money, gave it to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Repay you. You want to know how to gain eternal life? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love those who have, are still suffering from being exploited, stripped, wounded, and left for dead. Be moved with compassion and help somebody who's still wounded. 
But Jesus even knows more than that. Why did Jesus in this parable choose to use a Samaritan as the one who did the good deed? You see, there was a long-standing hostility between Jews and Samaritans. Samaritans, according to one commentary, were regarded as unclean people, descendants of mixed marriages that followed the, from the Assyrian settlement of people from various regions in the fallen northern kingdom. Second Kings 17.24 tells us about Samaritans. It reads, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvim, and placed them in cities of Samaria in the place of the people of Israel. In the place of the people of Israel. They took possession of Samaria and settled in its cities. So Samaritans and Jews had hostility, had tensions about them, and it was about culture, and it was about taking land, and it, and it evolved land. Jesus, by choosing a Samaritan as the one who would be the helper, is naming that tension to the Jewish man that he's teaching. Believe me, that man understood it all. He heard it because he knows of the tension. He knows that that may be the one he's trying to justify hating. Jesus makes him a hero of the story. He's naming the legacy of pain and trauma and tension and division. Jesus is doing that with one word, Samaritan. He's saying, help the one that history has caused you to other, caused you to dislike, caused you to resent. By choosing the Samaritan, Jesus calls us to face history while embracing humanity and tells us to go and do likewise. Our land, our country's history, the one that we were trying to celebrate on the 4th of July is a country that unfortunately is built on exploitation, slavery, genocide, and pain. And I continue to be amazed that Jesus' parable hits the nail on the head. And until we face history while embracing humanity, until we honestly grapple with the pain that so many people in our country have and that I believe all of it, regardless of our race, creed, or color, can be traced back to history. In one way or another, it's connected to a legacy of human tragedy and in many, many ways it manifests itself until we as a country are honest and we own it and we truly seek to repair and restore those who are wounded by a legacy of hatred and pain. Until we learn Jesus' lesson from this parable that we say, oh, that's the Good Samaritan parable, and we keep on moving. Until we learn that we have a responsibility to face history while restoring dignity and humanity to those who are broken by systemic hatred. We will come back to this place again and again. But many of us showed up today saying, make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me. Because you are the God who saves me. Nobody can tell me any different. I put my hope in you all day long. Let us leave here knowing that Jesus showed up for this very reason, to teach us God's ways. Let us continue to unpack the lessons of Jesus. There's more there than meets the eye. And let me tell you, what's love got to do with it? Love 
has everything to do with it. And often we quote 1 Corinthians 13 to, to unpack love. I suggest we start going to Luke 10 to unpack the kind of love that Jesus says will heal us and give us life. Learn from the parable. Ask questions like the expert, especially when you're trying to justify actions that you know in your heart are wrong. Say, God, how, how must I gain eternal life? If I do this that I'm thinking about doing or stop doing what I'm thinking about stop doing, will I still make it in? Study Jesus' messages. Explore the text. Unpack the text. Sometimes, as we said, correct the text. There are deeper truths than meet the eye. Keep showing up. I celebrate you. Keep showing up. We are showing up in some of the hardest times in our history. Keep showing up. And know this, that history and humanity and love have everything to do with it. Learn God's ways. Go, and to the best of your ability, do likewise. And begin, please begin to pass down a legacy of truth and love. God bless you.